2 Timothy 3.16 All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Okay, this was not an easy study for me to do because it's tough. I believe the worst thing about being a Christian is having the truth and nobody wants to hear it. I did a video on that. But I think one of the toughest aspects of being a Christian today is what we're going to be talking about today. Okay? Is sin justification to break fellowship? Before we get into that, let's talk about sin. Okay? So, Romans 6.23. Turn to Romans 6.23. Romans 6, verse 23. Let's talk about sin. That's what we're talking about. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. One thing you've got to get down, brothers and sisters in Christ, is that all sin is negative. There's no good aspect to sin whatsoever. All sin is negative. There's no justification for sin. There's no way that there's no sin out there that you can glorify God in. There's no sin out there that you can give God thanks in. There's no sin out there that pleases God. Sorry, brother and sister Christ, that's just the facts. All sin is negative, for the wages of sin is death. Okay? We're going to go into the state of man that we've talked about before, but we'll talk about it again. Okay? Romans 3.23, go back three chapters. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are everybody sins. There's two types of sinners. You have saved sinners and you have lost sinners. There's two types of reaction to sin. You have people that struggle with sin and you have people that justify sin. And we're going to talk about those two people. But let's stick with the state of man why we're getting on to the topic, because we got to hit this hard before we can get to that question. Um, is sin justification to break fellowship? Mark 2, 17. Turn to Mark 2, 17. When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Brothers and sisters in Christ, when we got saved, we came to God broken, broken um, repenting, having godly sorrow, guilt, godly sorrow for sinning against him. We believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, that Jesus died and paid for the sins of the world and when you go to get saved you say Jesus paid for my sins I believe that Jesus is God fully and completely Jesus died because of sin sin is not positive in any way shape or form after salvation you're a new creature in Christ Jesus I'm jumping ahead you're supposed to have fruits meat for repentance there's gonna be a changed life but Jesus came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance and we're gonna be talking about what's the about the word righteous as we keep going okay so jesus says that basically everybody's a sinner but those who are going to get saved is those that come to god broken as a sinner with godly sorrow not those who say i'm a good person i'm a good person self-righteousness okay what does paul say about the state of man saved or lost okay romans 3 10 okay That hence the saying, you have lost sinners and saved sinners, but all have sinned. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all 
gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good. No, not one. What am I trying to hammer here? We're all sinners. I just want to get this out, and we're going to keep hammering it a little bit more, that we are all sinners. This was a tough study for me, brothers and sisters in Christ, and it's a tough study um, to really, uh, it's just, we'll get to it. It's really tough um, being able to do this in a Christian's life. It's not fun, and it's not easy. Uh, Paul goes on to say in 1 Timothy 1.15, turn to 1 Timothy 1.15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. We are all sinners. And you have to have that attitude that I'm a dirty, rotten, filthy, low-down, no-good sinner on my way to hell and I deserve to go to hell. Lord, I'm sorry for sinning against you. I don't want to sin against you, but I have. And I'm sorry for it. I don't want to go to hell. You have to have that sorrow and afterwards, you're going to want to please God and you're not going to want to sin anymore. But I'm still a sinner. But I'm a saved sinner. And hopefully, brothers and sisters of Christ, you out there watching and listening, you're a saved sinner. Now, we're going to talk about, like I said, we talked about this. You have lost sinners and you have saved sinners. You're going to struggle with sin, even as a saved sinner. The whole point of the study is not for me to say that you have to be perfect and sinlessly perfect. For us to get to that question, I just want to get the state of man out there the way we are. We are two-thirds redeemed. We're not fully redeemed yet. Okay, Our soul is redeemed, our spirit is redeemed, but this body of flesh we're stuck in. We're getting tempted by this flesh, and we're getting tempted by the world. Remember the study we did, kind of jumping ahead a little bit, but remember we studied the study we did where about your le are your leaves withering? The whole point of this is sin justification to break fellowship. Go back and watch those studies, part one and part two. The two things that will get you out of fellowship with God, the number one thing is putting down this book. Stop reading the book. You're going to start falling, your walk with the Lord is going to start falling apart, and you're going to start falling into sin. The second thing is who you choose to fellowship with. You're not to fellowship with the lost world. Okay? But what we're going to find out here, as we get ahead, is it okay to fellowship? Is there any justification? Is sin a justification to break fellowship? Okay. So, we're going to talk about those who struggle with sin. The two things I said, two sides. There's those who struggle with sin, and there's those who justify sin. Okay. Um, so we're going to start with struggling with sin. Romans 7.22. Turn to Romans 7.22. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Remember what we talked about. It doesn't say sin and death. That's when you're lost. You're under the law of sin and death. It's talking about the law of sin. You're still in this body of flesh. It hasn't been redeemed. Which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from, this bo from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I may serve the law of God, We'll, say what, we'll talk about what that is. But with the flesh, the law of sin. The law of sin is you're in this flesh. You're still in this, we're, in, we're uh, in the world, but we're not of the world. We still have all the sin around us and this temptation. The Bible talks about how you won't be tempted above that you're able. But God will, with the temptation, make a way to escape. Paraphrasing. But there's no temptation that you can stand before God and say, I had no choice. It was just too strong. I had no exit. There was no way out. Okay. But the law of God is, is salvation. Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in. Remember what we talked about in uh, Romans 7 and 8, where we talked about how Paul is saying that your lost state, you're carnally minded and walking after the flesh. When you get saved, there's a change in your life. The Holy Spirit comes in, the law of God. You're saved by Jesus Christ. Um, you go, you become spiritually minded, 
and walking after the Spirit. And Spirit both times is a capital S. The Holy Spirit comes in, tells you what to do, opens this Bible, shows you instruction like we read at the very beginning of this study for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, righteousness. Correction, instruction, righteousness, and sometimes reproof is what we're going to be talking about throughout this study. Okay. Um, there's a change there. There's a war. That's, I'm sorry, I lost track. There's a war. You go from being 100% about the flesh to being 100% about Jesus Christ. It's all about giving God thanks and everything, about giving God glory, doing anything and everything that pleases God. If it doesn't please God, you get it out of your life. If you can't give Him thanks in it, you shouldn't be doing it. If you can't give Him glory in it, you shouldn't be doing it. Okay? It goes to be 100% about Jesus Christ. In your lost state, your flesh is in charge. There's no struggle. There's no fight. Okay? You just go by the flesh. When you come to God broken and you get saved, God saves you. The Holy Spirit comes in and now there's a struggle. There's supposed to be a struggle with sin. Your desire, when the Bible talks about having a perfect heart, your desire is not to sin against God. Are you going to fall flat on your face sometimes? I have. Big time. As a saved sinner. But your heart needs to be perfect before God and you have to have a desire to please Him. Not You don't want to sin anymore. Okay. Now, as we see there, there's supposed to be a struggle. Now let's talk about those who justify sin. Remember we talked about in other studies, worldly sorrow. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7.10, let's go there real quick. 2 Corinthians 7.10 Start in verse 9. Now rejoice not that ye were made sorry, but that ye sorrowed to repentance. For ye were made sorry after a godly manner, that ye might receive damage by us in nothing. Why does it say it like that? There's two types of sorrow. Verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. The way of the world is sin. And you can either have so godly sorrow for sinning against him, or you can have worldly sorrow saying, I, I don't want to get that up. Do I have to get that up? There's two types of sorrow. There's godly sorrow where you're sorry regardless of the consequences. You're sorry for who you've hurt. Not that you can physically hurt, but who you let down, who you disappointed, who you've sinned against. Or worldly sorrow, you can just have sorrow for the consequences. Right? That's what that verse nine's talking about. Not that she, not, uh, not that you were made sorry for consequences, but that you sorrowed to repentance. You were made sorrow after a godly manner. So we talked about worldly sorrow, the way of the world is sin, and you have sorrow that I don't want to give up this sin. I don't. I want my sin. I. So what does that lead to? It leads to a need to justify sin. You have to. That's the only way you can justify keeping sin in your life, keeping the world. You have to find a way to justify sin. And in doing so, what does that lead to? Self-righteousness. I'm still a good person. It just depends on how you look at it. Uh, that's just the way you see it. That's just your opinion. That's just your feelings. That's just the way your interpretation. Who we, we're going to get to all the different things later about what people who justify sin try to use some of the things they try to use. But having worldly sorrow leads to a need to justify sin. It has to if you want to keep your sin. And that need to justify sin, when you start justifying sin, what does that lead to? Well, i got to still be a good person and have sin in my life. And it leads to self-righteousness. John 3.19 Why do people feel a need to justify sin when it comes to worldly sorrow, justifying sin that leads to self-righteousness? So, turn to John 3.19 
And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Godly sorrow, true biblical repentance. Neither cometh to the light lest his deeds should be reproved. Why is they doing it? They love their sin. The light gets shined on their sin. You're wicked. You're no good. We talked about this. None righteous, no, not one. Uh, Paul says, I'm the chiefest of sinners. Okay? All of sin come to the short of the glory of God. All sin is negative. The wages of sin is death. Light gets shined on their sin. Remember W edged sword? Uh, thoughts and intents of the heart pierces asunder and knows the thoughts and intents of the heart. And they don't like it. Okay? So they find a way to try to justify sin. You have a lot of religious people trying to find a way to justify sin. Philippians 3.18. What happens when you have people justifying sin? Romans 3.18. When it comes to the lost world. No, Philippians. I said Romans. Philippians 3.18. My, I apologize. Maybe I said it right, maybe I said it wrong. But I was going to the wrong spot. Philippians 3.18. We can start in verse 17, actually. Brethren, be followers together of me. And mark them which walk so as ye have for an example of us. Okay? People who are walking with the Lord. Their heart is perfect before the Lord. They have a desire and they're doing their best to obey this word of God. They believe in a perfect written word of God. Uh, the true gospel, the major doctrines. They believe in the changed life, sanctification. Okay? Their heart's desire is to please God. Give them thanks in all things. Give them glory in all things. To live and be created in Christ Jesus. 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Look in the world, brothers and sisters in Christ. Look where the justification of sin leads. Everywhere I go, I see people glorying in their shame. They should have sh be ashamed of their sin. But they're not. They're glorying in it. They want nothing. Remember, the, the light shines on the darkness. and they, Men love darkness rather than light. Why? Right here. Um, whose God is their belly. Their flesh. We just talked about this. Their flesh runs them. Why? Because they're carly minded and they're walking after the flesh. And that's what they want. Mm -hmm. Justifying sin is not something, brothers and sisters in Christ, you want to fall into the trap of doing. Can a saved person fall into the trap of justifying sin? I believe that there could be a point, and we'll talk about it, we'll talk about it now, where sometimes you can get prideful, and when someone catches you doing something you're not supposed to, a shield comes up and you get defensive and you try to justify it at first. But then when that pride... God breaks that pride and you just afterwards you're like, you know what, that brother was right or that sister of Christ was right. What I'm doing is wrong. And you go back to him and say, I'm sorry for you know losing my temper. I'm sorry for that. You're right. The Bible says it's sin. I'm getting it out of my life. Uh, thank you for correcting me. Remember, all scripture is given by God. Well, correction is one of the things it's given for. Um, giving me instruction in righteousness. Okay. I believe there's that, but will a Christian sit there and just vehemently, vehemently justify sin all the time? No. That's what the lost world does. The reason you came to Jesus Christ broken as a sinner. Okay. You come to broken saying, okay, Lord, after you're saved, God saves you, you say, whatever's in my life, if you say it's sin, it's gone. You have a heart's desire, you have a zeal for the Lord, you want to please Him. Whatever's in my life that's sin, Lord, tell me, it's gone. You're not going to sit there and go, 
that sin, well, I don't care. I'm keeping it. What about, okay, that one doesn't bother me too much. I'll get rid of that. Oh, that, I'm keeping that. Sorry, Lord. Oh, that one, yeah, I don't really do that anymore hardly anyway, so I'll get that sin out of my life. See what I'm saying? i got to find a way to justify these two. Okay. Romans 13, 12. Turn to Romans 13, 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. We're going to keep going to the next one. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and, ev and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Do you understand what provision means? It means when you're going to go on a long trip, you need provisions. So you get food. Food that's going to be in front of you that you plan on eating. You're going to make sure to bring enough water that's right in front of you that you plan on drinking. You have clothes, an extra set of clothes that's right in front of you, you can see it, and you plan on wearing it. You take provision, provisions with you that you plan on using and doing. It's saying you don't put stuff in front of you that's sinful and wicked, because when you start putting that stuff in front of you, it becomes provisions, and you plan, you'll end up doing it. Like you're planning to do it. And it gets to a point, brother, sister, Christ, I'm guilty of it. You do plan to do it. When you decide, well, I'm going to compromise and let it in front of me and let it in front of me, you're actually saying, trying to find a way to do it. To provide the provision to fall into that um, sin. That's why the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. So, we're up here. Now, we're still not getting into the question just yet. Well, I guess we are. Is sin justification to break fellowship? Okay. There's two types of people, and there's two types of responses. We talked about the two different attitudes someone can have. Can a saved person justify sin? Uh, they can, Like I said, they can get prideful at first. I got caught, and I got embarrassed. I'm ashamed of it, and I you know, put up a shield, and I put up a defense, and then you come, he comes back or she comes back later. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have done that. You caught me doing something I wasn't supposed to, and I was very ashamed and everything. You know what I'm saying? But for someone to vehemently just sit there and defend it, and justify sin? Okay. Where's the conviction? Where's the chastening of the Lord? Those two things got to be there. Okay. Perfect heart with the Lord. It's not about being perfect, and we're going to find out with this. So, what is our response to sin and others? Two types of people we talked about. The lost world and saved sinners. So, lost sinners, saved sinners. Okay. Remember the title of this video. Um, is sin justification to break fellowship? And I had to include lost. Look at these Babel buildings. All right. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5.17. Please have your King James Bibles out. I know it's already been a little while into this study, but I love turning to the Scriptures. Make sure you have your King James Bible out and you're, you're turning and you're following along. 2 Corinthians 5.17. King James Bibles. Turn too much. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God, righteousness of God, in him. Why did I read 17? Because we who are saved are new creatures in Christ Jesus. We have a changed life. 
we've come to God broken. What's our response to sin and others as far as the lost world's concerned? We are now part of the ministry of reconciliation. We preach the gospel to them. We look at them and say, hey, you're sinners. We point out some of their sins, not because we're trying to correct just their sins and saying you have to do good works to be saved. We point out sins to say, hey, you are a sinner on your way to hell and you need Jesus Christ. We preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. So how do we treat the lost world? You preach the gospel to them. You point out that they're a sinner on their way to hell, and that they deserve to go to hell, and they need a savior. There's a way out of hell, and that's through Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.16. Go back to 1 Corinthians. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. You're to preach the gospel to the lost world. You don't want to get stuck... Um, debating and arguing with the lost world when it comes to sin. Well, I don't believe this is wrong, or I don't believe that. What about this? Is All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. You preach the gospel to them, the plan of salvation. If they want it, great. If they don't want it, brush the dust off your feet and move on. If they want it, praise the Lord. I said great, but praise the Lord. Um, they don't want it. You're not a car salesman. You're not beating them over the head with the gospel. You know, to the point of, if you don't accept the gospel, we're going to burn you at the stake. That's not how we're supposed to be, and we're going to find that out here shortly. Ephesians 6.10. Turn to Ephesians 6.10. Went too far. We're going to go down to verse uh, 20. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and put in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's why we're not to have the attitude also that we're not supposed to be attacking people physically. It's a spiritual battle. We're to preach the gospel to them. Okay. You always you're to be offensive spiritually and not physically, but you're supposed to be defensive physically and spiritually. You're allowed to defend yourself physically, but spiritually you're offensive and defensive. Thirteen. Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. If you invite people into your fellowship, are you going to be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked? No. Verse 17. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Okay. Stop there for a second. The whole point of this is right there where it says that in your verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. No, no, it's supposed to be the gospel of hate. It's supposed to be the gospel of anger, of, of bitterness, the gospel of violence, forcing people to believe. No. The, the gospel of deception, where we deceive people into saying a little prayer and getting saved. No. Uh, deception, we tell people you can get saved and keep the world and keep your sin. No, it's the gospel of peace. We're to preach the truth regardless, but we're supposed to do it peacefully. Mm -hmm. They want the gospel, praise the Lord. Someone gets saved, hallelujah. Amen, praise the Lord. They don't want the gospel, Brush the dust off your feet. Move on to the next city. Okay. And we'll keep going from 18. Because there's a point here I'm going to make. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. 
And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Uh, you got to learn to get bold, brothers and sisters in Christ. God will give you courage. Leave God. I always tell people, newly saved, if you got a great zeal and you have courage, don't speak boldly. You know, preach the gospel everywhere you go. When it's when the door opens, preach it. Uh, if you are like me and you're just not a big like outspoken person and a people person, as they say, I started leaving gospel tracts everywhere. Then God gave me the courage to start handing people gospel tracts. Now he's given me courage to say, hey, I'd like to tell you the gospel if you want to hear it. And so far, I haven't come across somebody who wants to hear it. So, I mean, I love talking about the gospel with my brothers and sisters in Christ, but I haven't come across somebody who actually wants to hear the true gospel, the plan of salvation. They either think they're saved and they don't need it anymore, or they just flat out reject Jesus Christ and want nothing to do with him. Now, okay... These Babel buildings, church buildings, they build a building, they call it a church, and they invite both lost and saved to it. And they try to fellowship with the lost world. Okay? 2 Corinthians 6.14 2 Corinthians 6.14 We're going everywhere today. Every verse, it's in the Bible. This is a very important study. 2 Corinthians 6.14 Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. It has an S at the end. If anybody tries to tell you, this is talking about marriage. All you have to do is ask them, am I allowed to have more than one wife? Am I allowed to have more than one husband if you're a woman? It says unbelievers, plural. Okay? It's talking about the lost world. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? What part hath he that believeth with an infidel. And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord. And touch not the unclean things, and I will receive you. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty." There is no such thing as fellowship with the lost world. You can't fellowship with the lost world. We're commanded not to fellowship with the lost world. So can you break fellowship with the lost world? Is sin justification to break fellowship with the lost world? No, because the lost world, you're not to be fellowshipping with them, period. You can't break something that you're not supposed to be doing to begin with. Right? Uh, now we're going to get into the say, but before I can go, let's talk about fellowship. What is fellowship? Prayer, reading the Bible together, praying for one another, praying together, reading the Bible together, studying the Bible together, singing hymns that bring glory to God. They don't please your flesh and bring glory to yourself. It glorifies God. Okay. Talking about the gospel together, going out and preaching the gospel together. Okay. Um, spiritual sacrifices, holding each other accountable to the word of God. Okay encouraging one another in all those areas encouraging the brethren that's fellowship talking about sports talking about jobs there's nothing wrong with that that's not fellowship if you have a lost family member that's asking you how you're doing you can talk to them and say hey this is what i'm doing uh hopefully god's opened a window and given you the courage to preach the gospel to them i've talked pretty much to all my family members about the gospel or at least offered to talk to them about the gospel my younger brother doesn't want to hear it, period. My older brother, um, you know, I don't want to go into all of it, but, you know, some people's like, I have family members that think they're saved and they're lost. They're a false convert like I was, and they don't understand why I am the way I am today. Um, but that's true fellowship. Are you supposed to do that with the lost world? No. You do not invite the lost world into your fellowship. You don't invite sin and wickedness and Satan, basically, into your fellowship. Does that mean you can't go fishing with your family member that's lost? Yeah, you can still go fishing with them. Maybe a door will open up and you'll get to preach the gospel. 
but are you supposed to talk to to your family member about Christian what we call Christian things, earth, uh, heavenly things, prayer, reading the Bible, studying the Bible, you know, good old uh, good Christian hymns, you know, the gospel, absolutely. That's the only one on the list. But you know what I'm saying? You don't try to tell a family member you shouldn't do that. That's wicked if they're lost because you point out that they're a sinner. But it's not going to do them any good. They can clean up their life and try to be the best person they can and be morally good. They're still going to wind up in hell without Jesus Christ. So, you can't fellowship with the lost world, so how can you break fellowship with somebody that you're not fellowshipping with to begin with? I had to point that out and make that very serious. Okay? You have to fellowship with the lost world. Remember we talked about, we're going to be mentioning this for the lost and for the saved. Uh... Your, uh, are your leaves withering? Putting down this Bible, but the other thing is, who are you fellowshipping with? Can pull you away from the God, your Lord and Savior, and hurt your walk and your relationship with the Lord. So now we're going to get into saved. What's our, um, what is our response to sin and others when it comes to saved sinners? Romans fifteen twenty seven. Turn to Romans fifteen twenty seven. It hath pleased him, it has pleased uh, it hath pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. For if the Gentiles have been made partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When they're okay, we we'll stop there. Carnal things. When you lead someone to Christ, they're going to have a lot of carnal things in their life. Okay, they just went from being carnally minded and walking after the flesh to being spiritually minded, walking after the spirit. Their life is going to be a mess. Why? Because we don't teach that you clean up your life and then get saved. Your life is going to be a mess after you get saved. Who cleans up your life? Jesus Christ. Who does he use to help minister unto those to help them? We point them to the book. We start quoting scripture to them. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Uh, you won't be tempted above the e or evil. Uh, you can come to God and ask him for forgiveness. He's faithful to forgive. Okay. Repent, forsake, move on. If you dropped your cross, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. Okay. Get back to where you left off with Jesus Christ. Okay. You're supposed to minister unto them so they can. you can give them the tools. Um, I did a study, and Brother Brian did a study at King James Video Ministries. I'm saved now, what? And I kind of did a study explaining it too. You know, first thing I do for that person that's truly that's newly saved is I'd make sure they have a King James Bible. And now God's blessed me with being able to do this, even if I have to buy one for him, and I will or her. Make sure they have a King James Bible. Teach them to pray. Okay. You teach them that they need to be reading the Bible every day. That they need to be studying the Bible. And you pray to God that he opens up the scriptures to you and gives you understanding. Shows you what you're supposed to be doing in life. what The do's and the do nots. Okay? You teach them what music is good music. That'll work, that glorifies God, not your flesh. You talk to them a little bit more about the gospel to equip them to go out and preach the gospel better. You know, they understand the gospel. They got saved. They have their testimony. But after salvation, I learned more about the gospel. You know, there's so many scriptures in the Bible about the gospel, and when you learn and learn all these different scriptures, and I'm not talking about more like new information, I'm talking about more scriptures that back the true gospel, it gives you more courage. It helps you to stand, stand, stand. So you have more courage to go out and preach the gospel. See, it says here, repentance. Here's another plot that talks about repentance. Okay, Oh, belief in the finished work of Jesus Christ, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jews first, then also the Greeks. Okay, we get all this, and then uh, confessing both in prayer. Asking God to save you. Call upon the name of the Lord, and thou shalt be saved. All these verses strengthen you. You learn more. Jesus Christ. Oh, I believe Jesus Christ is God fully and completely. When I got saved, it was God's blood that shed on Calvary. But then God opened your eyes to the Godhead and explains more about Jesus Christ. Okay, you get to learn more and more and more about your Savior. So, and then uh, spiritual sacrifices. You start pointing them to the Bible where it says, this is wrong, that's wrong, and you teach them how to read. And oftentimes, like with my life, when I first got saved, 
I had such a zeal. I went through tons of Bible study videos, reading the Word of God, and God's like, get that out, get that out. I went through all my movies, got rid of all my video games, and end up getting rid of all my movies, and had to start a whole new collection. And they're not movies like Hollywood movies, but started getting things like uh, Fanny Crosby story. I haven't watched it yet. In a future video, I'll be doing um, some movies I got. Uh, Flame in the Wind. Flame in the Wind. Cromwell. Uh, Sheffy. I'll go through and do like a movie review on a lot of the movies that I have gotten that are based off true stories. People's lives. Mm -hmm. But that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to minister unto them. Encourage them. Pray for them. Mm -hmm. 2 Timothy 2.15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. It's so important to teach them how to study the Bible. I've always taught there's three different ways to study the Bible that I know of, and someone might come up with another one. You can do a word study. Okay. You can do a subject study. Word study means you look at all the words that are in the Bible, and you find out which context applies to what you're wanting to teach, or you're just doing a word study period, and you're just saying, okay, here's all the different contexts, and here's the verses. They fall under this context. These verses fall under that one, and this one, the different definitions. And you do a word study. Uh, you do a subject study where you say, here's the subject, and any aspect of that subject, I'm going to go around throughout the whole Bible and find things that correlate to it, that strengthen it, and define it, and, under and explain it more in all the different situations for that subject. Okay? And then there's expository studies where you take the book and you say, okay, I'm going to read this section of this chapter, or you do the whole chapter, and I'm just going to write that, put it to the side, and then as you go through it, okay, here's this, I want to look this word up somewhere else. There's this subject, I want to look up somewhere else. But you're mainly focusing on that section, whether you're going through a book of Proverbs, or you know, a chapter in Proverbs, or a psalm, or a chapter in Romans. You know, you can do expository studies. Those are the three studies. You teach them how to do it. You give them the means to do it. So I make sure they have a King James Bible. I tell them that they can get a Webster's 1828 dictionary. I have to look in this sometimes because sometimes the one I do online, it doesn't have the word. And I have to look, in, look it up in here. Sometimes it doesn't have the different tense of how the word's being used. And I have a hard time finding the basic part of the word. So I can look it up in here and it has the tense. Uh, the Strong's Concordance, to get an actual, it's over there on the shelf. The Strong's Concordance. So if the computer's down, you don't have a sword searcher, power goes out, and you just feel a heart's desire to do a Bible study, you have the paper to look up words. All right. Where they're at in the Bible. I always tell people, ignore the Greek and the Hebrew where it tries to define the Greek and the Hebrew. And what the, ignore all that, just the back half where it's the concordance. That's all you want out of the Strong's Concordance. So, you're to minister unto them in uh, one way that you're supposed to respond to a sinner, someone who's newly saved. Equip them. Give them the Word of God, the power that God has through His Word. Tell them that you can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth you. My thing I always tell them, brothers and sisters in Christ, to newly saved Christians out there, don't make the mistake I did. You can't do it on your own. You can't have this zeal saying, Lord, I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to make you proud, and I'm going to get all this sin out of my life on my own. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to wind up falling flat on your face. You have to submit yourself to the Word of God. You've got to ask God for strength. You've got to ask God for wisdom. That's prayer. And as God tells you, get things out of your life, get them out of your life. He will give you the strength. When, I got, when God got all the bad things out of my life, I always tell people, when I was trying to do it on my own, it seemed impossible. I kept falling into the sin, I kept falling into the temptation, but when I finally handed my life to God fully and completely and saying, okay, Lord, I can't do it. I need your help. It got out of my life and I look back going, I don't know how it did it, how God did it, but he did it. I couldn't do it, God did. But you equip them. That's how you treat a sinner that struggles with sin, that's newly saved. Mm -hmm. And of course, Psalm 119, we said this, The word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against me, thee. You tell them to hide God's word in their heart. It's not head knowledge. It's a heart issue. Mm -hmm. When you hide God's word in your heart, you're living it. You're doing your best to live it. You believe it. All matters of faith and practice how you live your life. You, what you believe and how you apply what you believe. 
in the life that you live for Jesus Christ. Now, that's for people that are struggling with sin. Because we talked about two types of people struggling, struggling and justifying sin. Now, here comes the tough part of this study and what's hard for us, brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The Corinthians. Book of Corinthians, where everybody likes to run to, a lot of the false converts like to run to to try to justify sin. Oh, you can be a carnal Christian. If you've followed our studies on can a Christian be carnally minded, uh, you'll find out the answer is no. You're going to have a lot of carnal things in your life. You're going to have a lot of bad habits that God's going to break and get out of your life. But your heart's desire is not going to be, I want to sin. It's no big deal. Your heart's desire is, God, clean up my life. I don't want this life anymore. Clean up my life, Lord. It's yours. First okay. Corinthians 5, chapter 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Fornication was just out of control. And ye are puffed up and have not rather mourned that that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Taken away from among you. But notice it says mourned. Remember we talked about whose glory is their shame? They should be mourning. I sh anytime I fall back into sin and I'm not patting myself on the back, because if I was, I'd be like, wouldn't really want to come out and tell you that I fall back into sin. I'm a good person. I still fall back into sin, brothers and sisters of Christ, and when I do, I feel awful. My heart's like, you, your heart's not right with the Lord. And I start feeling bad, and I have to get to that broken part where I'm mourning my sin and saying, I've dishonored God. I'm not pleasing God. I can't give God thanks in what I'm doing. I can't give God glory in what I'm doing. And you have to get to that point to repent, forsake, and move on. Uh, deny yourself, pick up your cross daily, and follow me, Jesus says. Okay. Mourning. He's saying that you are puffed up. They're glorying in their shame. And have not rather mourned. Another way of looking at puffed up, could it be justifying sin? Who are you to judge me? I'm jumping ahead, but we're going to get to that part of the excuses people use. One I didn't put down in this study was, I've heard someone say before, I have the right to sin. Yeah, yeah you do, but you're going to answer for it, whether it's at the judgment seat of Christ or at the great white throne. Okay. Mm -hmm. That he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. For verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present. In other words, he wasn't there. He just heard it and said, hey, I'm judging. If you're doing this, you're not supposed to be doing it. And people who say we're not supposed to judge, we'll get to that part. If you're not supposed to judge, there's no way you can preach the gospel. As though I were present concerning him that hath done this deed, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when ye are gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're supposed to be taken away from among them. Verse 6. You're saying this is talking about lost people. Maybe false converts can fall underneath this, but we're going to see here that he's addressing brethren, but he's questioning them whether they're brethren. We're going to see this. Verse 5, To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? What's it talking about? You let sin in your presence. Remember we talk about not giving uh, provisions for the flesh? You let sin in, a little leaven, something that you struggle with, that you get tempted with, you let it in, it's going to start leveling the level. Le leaveneth, I can't even say it. Leaveneth the whole lump. It's going to leaveneth the whole lump. Okay? Sin's going to start creeping its way back in your life if you let it, let it get in front of you, if you let it in. Okay? That's why the Bible says abstain from all appearance of evil. You know, I'd put wicked things before your eyes. Verse 7. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. 
For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, right there, when it's talking, it could be talking about that situation, okay? They're lost. We talked about this. You're not to fellowship with the lost. You're not to let indulge in the sins of the lost world. But look what he says here in verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Verse 10. Yet not altogether with fornicators of this world, or with, or with the covetous or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. Like I said, it almost sounds like he's talking to the lost world. And he could be in context there. But let's wait till we get to the next part. Verse 11. But now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that be called a brother. No, it says if any man be called a brother. It doesn't say if a brother be a fornicator. It says if any man be called a brother. So he's saying it doesn't matter if they're lost or saved. This applies to both. Okay. If any man be called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or an extortioner, which such a one know not eat. Okay, we're not to keep company and we're not to eat with people that are like that. Saved or lost. Verse 12, what have I to do to judge them also that are without the lost world? Do not ye judge them that are within? But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So as we're getting into this study, we're learning that is sin justification to break fellowship? Well, there's two things you've got to look at. You've got to ask yourself two different questions before you can answer that question. Are they struggling with sin? If the answer is yes, they admit their sin, their faults, not their individual sins, like specifics, but their faults, they confess their faults, they're struggling with sin, God's overcoming it, sometimes they fall back into it, they're struggling with sin, then the answer is no. Sin isn't justification to break fellowship. As we're reading here, if they're giving in to that sin and they're justifying it and they're not giving it up, I ain't giving it up, I want this, I love this, is that, is that sin now justification to break fellowship? Yes. Why? You don't want that sin in front of you. We're going to talk about this using me as an example. Okay. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 17. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? I'm supposed to be turning to these, but I looked at the time. It's getting long. Obey the gospel of God. Judgment, I've always told you, brother and sister Christ, judgment begins here. Not the lost world, not your brothers and sisters in Christ. Judgment begins here. Your body's a temple for the Holy Ghost. Okay? Then, when you're judging here first, then are you able to judge brothers and sisters in Christ. People like to misuse that quote about the moat and the beam and say, see, we're not supposed to judge. You're not supposed to judge. But what that's talking about is you're not to judge hypocritical judgment. And how do you keep from being a hypocrite when you judge? You judge yourself first. Then you judge your brother and sister in Christ. Lastly, you judge the world. And the way you judge the world is you tell them how they're a sinner. The Bible says they're sinners and they're on their way to hell. And they need a Savior. They need Jesus Christ. In that order. Judgment must first begin at the house of God. Now, let's move on real quick. To the next part and the last part. I know it's been an hour and five minutes, roughly an hour already, but I believe this part is important. I've seen it. What people that justify sin hide behind. Like I said, uh, one of the things I didn't put on here, and I didn't really look at scripture, but there's people that say, I have the right to sin. It probably falls under the way of judging who are you to judge me, you know? And we will be talking about that one. So, one thing that. Uh, Brother JT did a video, and Tim's in it, um, where this guy, he's into rap music, satanic style music, the guy is a pedophile, and everything, and 
Tim's calling him out on it. And he's saying, don't you want to please God? Yeah, do you want to please God? And he hits this guy up and he backs him into a corner. And a thing that he says, once he's back into a corner, Tim's not talking to him like, are you saved or not? He's not treating him like he's a lost person at first. From my understanding, that short clip that I saw through Brother JT is he was treating him like he's saved and said, Hey, don't you want to please God? You're professing to be saved. You're doing something that's very sinful and wicked. But you're doing something that's very sinful and wicked. Don't you want to please God? And when Tim had backed him into a corner, guess what his response was? He went back to just saying, I'm not saved by works. You're teaching a false gospel. You're teaching works-based salvation. Every time a lot of these uh, free grace, faith alone, you know, it's you're saved by your faith through God's grace. And you can live however you want to live. They always come back and they've attacked me saying, you teach, teach a works-based salvation. You're like, okay, you claim to be saved. Now, what's your attitude towards sin in your life? I'm not saved by my works. That's one of the things you're going to get from them. So 2 Corinthians 5.17, I'm just going to read them because we're getting long on the video. So if you want to turn to 2 Corinthians 5.17, we talked about this. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. Your heart is going to become new. You're going to have a different attitude towards sin and a different attitude of how you want God to look at you. You want God to look at you and say, well done, good and faithful one. Thou good and faithful one. You want to be a man after God's own heart like King David. You want to be a disciple whom Jesus loved like John. Okay, You want to be uh, have such a love for the ministry like Paul did. Doing work for the Lord. Okay? Galatians 6.15, you go from being carnally minded and walking after the flesh to being spiritually minded and walking after the spirit. Galatians 6.15 for in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus? It's about Jesus Christ. He died for your sins. We believe that. It's not about doing good works. You can't earn your salvation. Remember what I said. We believe when you get saved, repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And after God saves you, you stop there and you look at your life and you can get overwhelmed and say... My life is a mess, and it's going to be. I don't know of one Bible-believing, God-fearing man and woman that when they first got saved, looked at their life, and it was perfect. As far as perfect, my walk with the Lord was perfect. No, they looked at their life, and you probably were like me, very overwhelmed. What do I, where do I start, Lord? It's a mess. Where do you want me to start? We don't teach that your life is clean, but your heart changes, and you want your life to be clean. And you have to, like I said, I always warn you, brother, says Christ, I screwed up. You come to God. He will clean your life up. You can't do it on your own. These false converts that attack a changed life after salvation, they don't want to come to God. The real Jesus Christ. Because they don't believe in the real Jesus Christ. Which means we're going to get to the infamous Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Okay, They like to quote 8 and 9, but they don't like to quote 10. Okay? Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship. 8 and 9 says, um, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus, created, new creature in Christ Jesus, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. And it says here, which God hath before ordained, in other words, it talks about, Jesus talks about fruits, meat, or John the Baptist, fruits, meat for repentance. He ordained it. If you truly repent, after you get saved, you're going to have fruits, meat for repentance. You're going to have a changed life. That we should walk in them. Your walk with the Lord is going to be continuous till the day you die. You're going to struggle with sin till the day you die. God's still pointing up. You'd be surprised. You think you got it all together, and you're like, I'm not talking about all together like I'm perfect. I'm talking about your home. I always tell you, brothers and sisters in Christ, that your home is the only place today that you can make and abstain from all appearance of evil, free zone, as I like to say, a free zone of all appearance of evil. But even when I think I've got this house completely all appearance of evil free, no wicked thing here that's before my eyes, 
every so often it's getting rarer and rarer, praise the Lord, but God will show me something. What about that over there? Okay, I gotta look up that image online, or I gotta do this and do some research. Okay. Yeah, it's it's wicked, Lord. I'm throwing it out. And I throw it out. Um Remember what I said, always come back to Romans 7 and 8, the changed life. That's the best example to go to when you're talking about um, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Okay. You go from being carnally minded and walking after the flesh, your body, your flesh being in charge, to God being in charge, spiritually minded and walking after the spirit. It's all about pleasing God, not your flesh. Okay. The next thing you come across, which we talked about a little bit, is judging. They'll come at you and say, those who justify sin, um, and like I said, even saved people can fall back into this trap a little bit. I don't believe they can fall into it hardcore and start acting and talking like the lost world does. I don't. But I do believe a saved person can fall back into this a little bit. Okay? Who are you to judge me? 1 Peter 4.17. We're going through this verse again. Okay. For the time has come that judgment must first begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? Judgment begins here. First. Always begins here. When it comes to judging, I judge myself first according to the scriptures. Not my feelings, not my opinions. My flesh doesn't dictate the judgment whatsoever. The lost world doesn't dictate the judgment whatsoever. This word of God does. It's the foundation. Jesus Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The Bible says to sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. All right. Judgment begins here first. Then, when you've got the moat, or no, beam out of your own eye, then you can see clearly, okay, I struggle with these things. There's some things I don't struggle with, but God's opened the scripture to me. I can correct a brother or sister in Christ. And then, of course, with the lost world, like we talked about, preaching the gospel to them, that they're sinners. And that comes back to what I'm saying. When I made that statement earlier, people are saying, well, what are you talking about, probably? If you're not allowed to judge, you can't preach the gospel. Okay? People say, what are you talking about? Uh, when you preach the gospel, do you tell people that they're sinners? And that they're on their way to hell? And that they need a Savior? Some people don't. But some people, these people you're not supposed to judge, you hit them up about that. Well, yeah, I tell them that. You know what that's called? judgment. You're judging them. You're telling them that they're sinners. You're judging them. And you're telling them, according to scriptures, you're, it says you're a sinner for all have sinned. The wages of sin is death. You're telling them, according to scripture, if you die in your sins, you're going to go to hell. Right now, you're on your way to hell. That's judgment. And the people who say, well, we don't do that. We just tell them about Jesus Christ. Do you tell people that Jesus died for their sins? Well, yeah, we tell people. That's judgment. You just said that they're a sinner because you just said Jesus has di died for their sins. If you're not allowed to judge, you wouldn't be capable of preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So these people, what they're doing is they're trying to justify their sin. It goes back to struggling versus justifying. The lost world loves to justify their sin. And brothers and sisters in Christ, don't fall back into that trap of starting to justify sin. Letting your flesh get, start to build up. Put the flesh down. You do it through this. You do it through prayer. Godly music. Memorizing godly old hymns that bring glory to God. Memorizing scripture. Hiding your word in your heart. 1 John 4, 1. Believe, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. Because many false God, prophets are gone out into the world. Okay? In the Bible, we're, talked about, we're warned about false brethren, wolves in sheep's clothing, uh, not to fellowship with the lost world, about false prophets, we're even warned about Satan. The Bible says, um, Be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You look into the Old Testament, um, what was happening in the Old Testament? This might be a great study someday, I might do it on it, is the Old Testament people, the lost world, was trying to entice the Jewish people to get them to sin against God. And if Satan could get them to sin against God, then God would have to punish them. You think that's not going on today? These false converts coming in? A lot of my teachings, I always tell you, be sober, be vigilant. You have servants of Satan 
transforming themselves into ministers of righteousness, trying to pretend to be Christians. Pastors, teachers, prophets, whatever. And there's twofold purpose of them. One we talked about, they're trying to create more false converts. They're trying to keep people away from the real Jesus Christ as much as possible. But one of the other big things is they're trying to mess you up. And if they can get you messed up, God has to punish you. Chastisement. You miss out on rewards. You can lose your testimony, which also helps keep people from get, uh, keep people away from Jesus Christ. Nobody can prevent you from getting saved but you. But they can make it hard. We talked about how to deal with people who profess to be saved. Trying to witness to those people is very hard. All right. So the next thing that they're going to talk about is grace. Okay, we're not saved. It almost goes in hand hand with that. We're not saved by works. All right, we're saved by our faith. I mean, we're saved about grace. Sometimes they'll say grace alone by faith alone. Uh, that means you're saved by two things. So it's faith and works. You've turned faith into works, so it's God's grace and works. Uh, no, it says you're saved by God's grace. It says through faith, but it doesn't say faith alone. And it doesn't make it where it's just God's faith, period. They used to say faith alone. Now they're trying to say grace alone through faith alone. They really don't want to let go of that faith alone junk. It doesn't say faith alone. Do I believe in works to be saved? Absolutely not. Do I believe through faith? Absolutely. But they can't let go of something that's not in Scripture. You will never find faith alone in Scripture. Maybe these Bible perversions, but not the King James Bible. But Romans chapter 6, verse 1, if you want to turn there. I know some brothers and sisters in Christ... That know where I'm going with this. Right? Oh, we have God's grace. Just put it on my tab. God will forgive me. It's not that big of a deal. Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? It's after salvation. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin... Remember, you're no longer carnally minded and walking after the flesh. The law of sin and death... You're not part of that anymore. That we are dead to sin, live any longer therein. Know, know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. The old man dies. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. And like as Christ was raised from the, up from the dead, the new man, new creature in Christ Jesus, by the glory of our Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall, all, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Be ye holy as I am holy. Jesus. Um, verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, the hold that sin has over you and the flesh has over you, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is free from sin. So is grace a justification for sin? Absolutely not. Paul says no. God's perfect written word, God says no. Now we get to the last one that I've been hit with by professing Christians that sometimes they're in my question mark, sometimes they're in my saved, and then they go, you know, just kind of bouncing back and forth because after what I've been through, and I haven't been through what some of the other brethren out there have been through in ministry, um, I'm always cautious now, especially what I went through recently. It's like you've got to have your shield up. You can't um, compromise. You've got to drill them with the Word of God and make sure they line up with the Word of God, their beliefs, and how they're trying to live their life. Are they struggling with sin? Are they striving to please God and obey His Word with the life they live? But this one I hear a lot. Uh, liberty. We have liberty. Now, as we get into this first verse, verse if you want to turn to Galatians 2.4, I have been called a liberty thief. A liberalist. I can't remember if I was call, call, told I'm in an occult, but I've had two people that profess to be saved, brethren, go off on me hardcore. And all I listed was one verse, abstain from all appearance of evil, and they went crazy. But let's, let's get to Galatians chapter 2, verse 4. 
and that because of false brethren unawares brought in who came in pri privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus that they might bring us into bondage. Okay? They'll quote that and say, we have liberty. You're just, you're a liberty thief. You're trying to steal our liberty. What are they when they told me that I'm a liberty thief and a liberalist, what would they say in? What does it say here? And that because of false brethren brought in unaware, I call them out on their sin and prove it with scripture, and they can't justify their sin with scripture. All they can do is quote this verse, and then they call me a liberty thief. What are they doing? They're saying I'm lost. I'm a false convert. They might not know that they're intentionally doing it, but that's what they're doing. They're saying I'm lost because I'm trying to um, spy out their liberty and bring them back into bondage. I'm a liberty thief because I point out sin. Now, do you have liberty to sin? 1 Corinthians 8, 9. Okay. I'm going to turn to 1 Corinthians 8, 9. The so-called carnal Christians. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours became, become a stumbling block to them that are weak. All right. The reason I wanted to preach this one, I, this isn't the one I was thinking of. But yeah, the people that are supposed to be carnal, they're always hitting Corinthians up. But what it's talking about here is there's some things, there are some things out there, brother and sister in Christ, that isn't a sin, but somebody else might have idolized it or coveted it, and it got in the way of their walk with the Lord. So for them, it became a sin because of how they held it above the Lord. And they got it out of their life. And you're not supposed to use your liberty as an occasion for a stubborn block or for a stumbling block to them that are weak. Okay? I want to throw that in there. I understand that. Video games don't fall under this. Drunkenness doesn't fall under this. Fornication doesn't fall under this. Drugs doesn't fall under this. Hollywood movies doesn't fall under this. Okay. You see what I'm saying though? That doesn't fall under this. Sin is sin. Sin doesn't fall under this. This talks about things that aren't sinful, but somebody else coveted and it became idolatry and they got out of their life. You don't go over there and start talking about those things with that person or showing a flash in that thing and throwing it in their face saying, look at me, I'm doing it, I'm doing it. You know what I'm saying? You don't use it as a stumbling block. But that's not what these people are when they're trying to justify sin. What's going on? Galatians 5.13. We're going back to Galatians. So uh, Galatians 2.4 says there's people coming in to steal their liberty. Spy out their liberty and bring them into bondage. Now did God foresee that some people might take that and try to abuse it and misuse it? Galatians 5.13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. But by love, serve one another. You're not to use liberty as occasion to the flesh, to justify the flesh. You're not to use liberty to cause other people to stumble, as a stumbling block, to cause other people to fall into sin. Okay. First Peter chapter 2, verse 16. As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of malice, maliciousness, but as the servant of of God. I've come across people that try to say, who are you to judge me? I have, and they've been mean. I've come across people that say, you're teaching works-based salvation, and they've been mean. I've come across, um, what was the other one, grace people, and they kind of been mean, you know. But the number one person I've come across type of people that are really vicious are people that try to say we have liberty to sin. I'm sorry, just in my experience, that's what I've come across. It says, using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Okay? Maliciousness, extreme enmity or disposition to injure. Enmity is enemy. They just, you poke their sin, they come back with, we have liberty, and it's almost like they become an enemy. You're their enemy now because you poke their sin. Okay? They have a disposition to injure. Like I said, Will, willingly or not, they basically called me lost for pointing out their sin. Willfully or ignorantly, they basically called me lost for pointing out their sin. And a disposition to injure, they're hurting people that they're fellowshipping with, causing them to stumble and fall into sin. Because they're justifying sin, trying to use liberty. Maliciousness, notice it says extreme. 
The base word of maliciousness is malicious. And when you look that up, it says proceeding from extreme hatred or ill will dictated by malice. So take that and say, if when you say maliciousness, like in that verse, it's taken to an extreme. I've gotten some really hate and bitterness from people who try to use liberty as a justification to sin. God knew about it. He warns us. So, when you speak to people that justify sin, what is the response you get? Okay. That includes everything. When you come across somebody, you poke their sin, and they're not somebody that struggles with sin. They're someone that says, I love this sin. I want this sin. I'm not giving it up. So what do they do? They have to find a way to justify it. So what are their response going to be? Turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous. We're going back through this. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongue they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. I've gotten that from people who try to hide behind, um, I'm not saved by my works. I have grace, God's grace. Um, you know, I have, I'm justified in sin by God's grace. Um, who are you to judge me? Okay, I've gotten cursing. I've gotten bitterness. Like I said, but the worst I've gotten is from people who def defend liberty. And the only time I've seen people that I want to say they're saved that use that justification, we have liberty, we have liberty, um, from a saved, someone who's, like I said, it's almost like a question mark. It's the only way I can say it. I mean, it's gotten really harsh from them. I get called names. It's like they've got bitterness. I become the enemy. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The way of peace have they not known. I know this is talking about lost people, but for instruction and in righteousness, when I fall back into sin, I don't have peace. I don't have peace. I don't have joy. I'm miserable. The flesh might be happy, but since I am no longer, the flesh is no longer in charge, spiritually, I'm alive. I'm qu he who uh, quickened. My spirit's been made alive. I'm not spiritually dead anymore. I'm miserable. I have no joy and I have no peace because I'm out of fellowship with the Lord, because I'm falling into sin. Okay, there is no fear of God before their eyes. That's what it comes down to. A lot of these professing Christians, there's no fear of God before their eyes. The Jesus they serve isn't Jesus Christ, the capital L Lord Jesus Christ. He's an antichrist. There are G He's a Jesus that they don't have to fear. He's a big teddy bear, a lovable teddy bear. He's not someone to be feared. He's my friend. He's my savior. And then you go, well, what about your king? The king tells you what to do and you do it. What about your master? You're a bondservant. He's the master. You're a servant. He's the king. He's God who created everything. Your creator. It doesn't really go well when you start getting to those other titles. They just like the title where God is love and, and he's just my friend and you know, he's my savior. He's all, he's like my husband, like the Bible talks about spiritually, or the bride of Christ. But they don't like to talk about those other titles. Yeah. There's no fear of God. And brothers and sisters in Christ, do I believe that we can get distracted by the cares of this world and drop our guard and we're forgetting sometimes uh, to fear the Lord? I believe you can sometimes a little bit. I fall back into sin, that fear comes back quick. When I realize I'm, I'm not happy, God convicts you through the Holy Spirit and through His Word. That fear should come back quick, brothers and sisters in Christ. And then you try to keep your guard up. How do you keep your guard up? Making sure that fear stays there. You never stop fearing the Lord. It doesn't matter how good you're doing for the Lord or how right on the right track you are, on the right path. Your life for the Lord seems to be going great. Your walk with the Lord is strong. Don't drop your guard and stop fearing the Lord. Mm -hmm. Don't drop your guard and think, everything's just great. I don't have to be sober and be vigilant anymore. Everything's great. Don't drop your guard. 
I'm sorry that the study went long, but it was very important for me. I've had some emails from some brothers and sisters in Christ about this. All right. You have to. It's hard. It's painful. But bottom line is sin justification to break fellowship. If you're struggling with sin, no. But are you supposed to just ignore the struggle? No, you're to encourage them with the Word of God. You pray for them, you encourage them with the Word of God. They, Let's say they call you up, a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ. I fell into this sin and I f this is my fault that I told you about. I fell into it. I just, just let the Lord down and everything. You don't come back. The first response isn't, well, don't worry about it. We're all sinners. It's just, it's, we have this flesh we have to deal with. We're all sinners. It's not a big deal. The first thing you ask them is, hey, did you get that back out of your life real quick? Oh, yeah, you know, I, God helped me get it back out. Praise the Lord. You can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth you. You're not supposed to put anything wicked before your eyes. So praise the Lord you got that out of your life. Um, do you know what caused you to fall back in that, te te what temptation did you accidentally let, let back in your life? Or are you making sure there's no temptation? You talk about the word with them. You encourage them. God will forgive you, brother. He'll forgive you. Don't let that get you down. After you talk about to him about repenting and forsaking, then you talk to him about moving on. Don't let that sin hold you down and keep you from your walk with the Lord. You've forsaken it. You've repented, you've forsaken it, get back to your work, work for the Lord, get back to your walk with the Lord, get where you left off. That's how you treat somebody who struggles with sin. How do you treat somebody who justifies sin? You try to do the same thing, but when they just don't want to give up that sin, nothing you can say, no matter how much scripture you quote, what do you do at that point? Withdraw yourself. That's another thing, but uh, put away from yourself that wicked person with no, not one, eat. Eat no with one, no not. Okay? And then you keep praying for him. You always pray for him, brothers and sisters of Christ. Now, when that happens, it's not permanent. Don't think I'm saying you just forget them and race them, uh, write them off. They're gone. No, you keep praying for them. And when their heart, whether it's through conviction, through chastisement, when their heart gets back to being right with the Lord, you invite them back in. And say, come back, brother Christ. And you praise the Lord that God helped him overcome that sin. That he dropped his pride and came broken and God got that sin out of his life. Or it might still be in his life a little bit, but it's the heart. His attitude towards it changed. It's no longer justifying it. He's no longer saying, I don't care. It's, I, don't, I know it's a sin, but I don't care. I want it. He's going to, I don't want it. His attitude changes. I don't want it. You can invite him back into your fellowship. Okay, you don't get uh, like the Catholic Church, uh, anathema. No, you can invite them back in. So is sin justification to break fellowship? You have to ask yourself, are they struggling with sin? Are they justifying sin? Those are the two most important questions after you ask yourself, is sin justification to break fellowship? Uh, this is a hard study, brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all and my love for you in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'll see you in the next video.